Welcome back to Waterpark Rangers Let's Play Pikmin 2. Uh, last episode we met the Blue Pikmin, and then we had them carry a ravenous Whisker Pillar for fun, so I can show you what it looked like. It kind of squirms around a bit. Um, but if we were to have them carry it now, they'd have to take it all the way back to their onions, so we won't do that. Um, over here we have a weird ro uh, rock uh, formation in this water. This In this puddle there's a weird rock formation, that's what I was trying to say. Like something that starts with an R. What is that thing called again? Oh, I know, a rock! And when you break it, um, it drains the water from that little pool right there and leaves a very nice looking shoreline right there <laughs> in a perfect little semicircle. Now the blue pikmin might take a while to be working at that um, if we set them there. And there isn't anything back there that you would need them for. There isn't really anything... There isn't too much water in this area. In fact, I know I think that if I designed a pikmin game it might be kind of flawed because it has so many areas of water or so many parts where you need water, uh, blue pikmin, and have to bring them through water. Obviously that's their ability, in case I hadn't mentioned it. Um, because I just love how much, how, how, like, the, uh, the water looks in the areas of the pikmin games. And generally, uh, I associate water with creating some pretty interesting natural environments to explore, so I guess that would just be one of the problems that I'd have if I designed a pikmin game, because I'm sure that I have a lot of awesome ideas, but... And it, trust me, if I made Pikmin 3, I think it would be better than however they are going to make it. I'm just saying. I mean, obviously, I can't program for crap, but I have a lot of cool ideas. And anyway, uh, that doesn't matter at all, so we'll just have all of our work on uh, that over there. And with our blue Pikmin, there's nothing to do over there, so I've thought about perhaps setting them on a different task. First, we'll get these reds out of the way. There's actually something back there that our yellows need to take care of. So I'll have them do that right now. I have thought of something good that our, that our blue Pikmin can do at the moment, and actually, I'm surprised that I never thought of this before. This is the first playthrough where I'm going to be a little bit more efficient with how I do things. Um, and I, I might actually finish Pikmin 2 this playthrough faster than I ever have. Obviously, this is not going to be any 8-day run. I've been taking my good time with a few things. Um, but it is a good idea to be able to multitask efficiently nonetheless. So, instead of having the Pikmin walk over to that electric fence, I prefer to throw them because then you don't have to guide them up the narrow path passage. It's just so much easier to just toss them out to this section right here and have them work on the fence. So that's what they're going to do. Yellows will work on the electric fence. And I've thought about bringing our blue Pikmin to a different area. Now, normally I would just bring them back to the onion like an idiot, but instead what I'm going to do is go over this way and head to an area of this area, <laughs> a section of this area, uh, to make things less confusing, that we haven't explored before. It's over where we found the map that we recovered um, a few episodes ago that opened the perplexing pool. Well, if you head down this route, you've got a little uh, watery area with some yellow wallywogs. Um, we fought these in the perplexing pool, so they're not new enemies. Of course, they're a little bit more dangerous than most enemies we've encountered by this point. In fact, they might be... No, never mind. I was, just... I was about to say they might be the most difficult enemy we've encountered. And I'm like, wait, did I, for... did I totally forget uh, about that spotty bull bear in the glutton's kitchen? <laughs> but yes, yellow wallywogs are quite dangerous. Of course, they're not nearly as dangerous as they were in the first Pikmin game. And we have a bridge that's actually covered in poison. So in order to build that bridge, we're first going to have to build the first one so that later we can bring whites across to build it because only they can resist the poison. In the meantime, we might as well do what we can to that yellow Wallywog, which isn't much. Fortunately, the blue Pikmin are quickly going to build that bridge. And, ad and additionally, in additionally, additionally, there is another treasure in this area that you'll need blues to recover. Um, but I don't think we're going to be able to get it this day because there's not enough time. So we'll just do that the next day we come back to this area. I'm not really worried. I usually take two days to finish this. Only if you're doing a... Uh, I mean, usually I take three or four days to finish this area. But if you're doing an 8-day run, you got to finish this area in two days. In fact, if you're doing an 8-day run, you've got to finish uh, Awakening Wood and Perplexing Pool in two days each. Honestly, I think the hardest part of that run just sounds like finishing the Perplexing Pool in two days. Like, seriously, that area, I think, is just kind of ridiculous for how long it takes to do some stuff in it. Now that that fence is out of the way, yes, there's a bitter plant up here, but since we're not collecting bitter sprays, we only care about collecting the treasure. You don't need to throw up yellows particularly to get it. But I had them on hand, so they were the most useful for the job. And those things that were sitting in the water there looked familiar? Well, they should. Those are the same things as the scales that we had to get past on the, um... Oh, right. They were in the perplexing pool on the day that we went to find the yellows. So, scales are not out of the picture yet. Um, unfortunately, scales, although they're really cool, and yes, uh, if you brush up against those flowers where you get uh, spectral lids, although they're really cool and all, the thing about... Uh, the scales is they don't appear as much as I'd like them to. 
unfortunately. We've got that a set there for a kind of fun puzzle that they have set up um, that we're going to do in the next day we're here. And they do appear again later in Perplexing Pool. But besides that, you don't find them anywhere else. You don't get them in the Valley of Repose, and you don't get them in the last area of the game. That's right, there are actually four areas, um, not three. <laughs> in case you couldn't tell, each area has a motif for a different uh, season. So I guess I won't spoil directly um, what what that would be for the last area. You'll see in due time. In fact, it's kind of a memorable area. I know this is a random thing to say, but last night, I slept for 13 hours straight because normally I'm so sleep deprived uh, during the week. I just slept for 13 hours. And for a large portion of that, I was I had a dream about the last area of this game and a certain enemy that was encountered in it. And I was just like looking at them. And it was really weird. And then I looked like over the boundaries of the area and for some reason it was like upstate New York. I don't know. <laughs> well then again, dreams aren't really... I'm not sure they're supposed to make sense. They just combine different stuff and put them together and that's kind of interesting, I guess. I'm not one of those people that normally remembers what I dream. And you're supposed to, every time you fall asleep, I hear this about sleep, um, you're supposed to generally dream about, um, like, every single time you fall asleep, you're supposed to dream. But most of the time I don't remember, so I kind of just assume, hey, I didn't dream last night, but I suppose that's not the way it works. I mean, I'm no expert on sleep-related stuff, but it's kind of interesting to think about. I mean, kind of interesting to think about, like, the whole concept of dreams. There's some people who have theorized that when you're dreaming, you're actually envisioning parallel universes. And for a certain theory that I myself have about that, I think that's probably true. Um, if you've ever heard about the 10th Dimension uh, Theory, and this is actually something I have favorited in one of my videos, my uh, favorites, then one thing that I think is interesting about the 10th Dimension is it's a dimension that encompasses all, possi all possibilities, basically. So if you're encompassing all possibilities, that means you're counting for all parallel universes. And that ba basically means everything that could be is. So in case, so basically what that means is every time you're having a dream, you're envisioning something in the 10th dimension which encompasses everything. Ergo, you're dreaming about a parallel universe, which is kind of cool to think about. Hello, I'm still on the land for deck debt collectors. For the time being, I've decided to live under the bridge, but if they catch me, I don't know what they'll do to me. So yeah, the president is coming on some hard times now. Uh, those debt collectors are after him due to him not being able to pay back the loan sharks. And someone mentioned this, and I think it's really obvious. How does the president mistake happy savings and loan for a company which is literally called All Devouring Black Hole Loan Sharks? That doesn't make any sense. Oh, and speaking of black holes, I've been reading uh, the story Problem Sleuth. Uh, it's on the MS Paint Adventures website. Recently, I just started reading it again after not reading it for a while. Um, it's absolutely crazy how much they screw with physics in it. But yet at the same time, it's incredibly consistent with physics. I know it sounds crazy, but in case you're ever interested, um, it's a really difficult read due to be due to just how flat out quirky it is. And that's saying a lot. I mean, you're watching a Pikmin 2 Let's Play right now. But if you ever get the chance, I recommend um, maybe giving some time to Problem Sleuth. It's a great story. Of course, if you're of a certain age and you're watching these videos, there's uh, quite a bit of swearing in it. So just a uh, forewarning. Uh, just warning about that in case you ever decide to read it. Because I have gotten complaints that I swear too much in these videos, and I don't think that's true at all. I Occasionally I might say, damn, or crap, or one time I think I said, um, the S-H-I-T word. <laughs> but, you know, I tend to not do it that often. I, I have very good self-control for when I record, because trust me, normally I'm quite foul-mouthed. I know it sounds crazy, but, like, I can be pretty foul-mouthed. But I'm generally good at uh, being, keeping these kind of things under control. That way, you actually hear useful things or informative things like metaphysical questions, like during this video, instead of a uh, sailor mouth swearing. If you want to hear swears, watch that episode of SpongeBob. I think it was literally called Sailor Mouth. And also, we've encountered a really cool new dungeon here. So, you've at last reached the higher ground. Congratulations are in order. Yes, they are. First time this ever happens in the series. Wait, what is that? My seismic sensors are picking up tremors deep below. You have so many sensors. What work is what forces at work in the depths of this planet? Unfortunately, you'll only find out what force what, find out what uh, forces at work in the depths of the planet next episode, uh, because this dungeon might take longer than the others so far, and we will see exactly what's in it next episode. I'll see you then.